This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we have Helmut Lutz, who is a uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Austrian Archaeological Institute of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, he is actually a recent awardee of the Chairman's Fellowship for Numismatic Research by the AS, ANS, and that allowed him to come here for uh, two weeks to uh, conduct research with our collection. Uh, today is going to be presenting on uh, Lycian dynastic coinage and towards new chronology. So, Helmut, I hand it off to you. Thank you for this introduction and good afternoon and welcome to my presentation on my research on the chronology of Lycian dynastic coinage. I will try to share the screen. Oh, so. Can you all see my presentation? Perfect. Great. Uh, in the first 10 minutes or so, I will give you a brief introduction into archaic and classical uh, Lycia its political system and its coinage. In the main part of my talk, I will then present some results of my work on the uh, Lycian coins in the ANS collection. Ancient Lycia is a region in the southwestern part of Asia Minor, modern Turkey. It forms a peninsula between the Gulf of Fethiye in the west and the Gulf of Antalya in the east. This historical map from a late 19th century expedition shows the mountainous character of the Lycian landscape. The Akda massif in the center of the map belongs to the Taurus range and reaches almost 10,000 feet before dropping into the Mediterranean Sea. In antiquity, the mountain barrier hindered the access of foreign powers from the central Anatolian highlands. According to Herodotus, the Lycians were among the few people of Asia Minor uh, that were not subjugated by um, the Lydian king Croesus in the mid 6th century BC. However, a few years later, the Lycian capital Xanthos was conquered by Cyrus general Harpagos, and Lycia became part of the Persian Empire. However, the Lycians retained a high level of autonomy under Achaemenid rule. Geographically, uh, the Lycian landscape is divided into several sub-regions. There are three settlement areas which I have marked uh, in color on this map. Red is the Xanthus Valley in, the western, in western Lycia, which historically is the Lycian heartland. Green are uh, the central Lycian hilllands, which due to the lack of major plains and water sources, had a very different agricultural profile and settlement pattern. Blue is the coastal plain of Limura, the major settlement of eastern Lycia. This photo shows a view over the upper Xanthus Valley. Coming down from the central Anatolian highlands, the Xanthus River formed an alluvial plain uh, that is uh, between three and seven miles wide. Its fertility allowed the development of major settlements, such as the capital Xanthus in the lower part and Pinara and Tlos in the upper part. In contrast, the um, central Lycia is characterized by rocky hills and small fruit plains that usually provide agricultural resources only for few people. Moreover, due to the local limestone, water is extremely scarce in that area and cisterns are essential. These circumstances led to the development of a great number of small settlements. The photo was taken from the castle of Trusa at the eastern edge of the plateau. In the center, you can see a typical uh, central Lycian fruit plain of far less than a square mile, still, uh, still used for agriculture today. This photo shows the eastern Lycian coastal plain of Limira, which was also the area in which in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, 
Greek settlers from Rhodes founded colonies. These early Greek colonies provided first contacts to the Greek culture, but quickly got assimilated by the Lycians. In the background, you can see the high mountains of the Bay Dalery, which provided alpine pastures for the hot summer months. The natural conditions which I have just outlined hindered the political unification of Lycia and led to fragmentation into small dominions. Local rulers resided in fortified settlements on hilltops or cliffs and passed on the reign in the family over several generations. These dynasts, as they are usually called, continuously fought each other for priority and possibly hegemony over all of Lycia. Some of them were formally recognized by Achaemenid administration and were involved in military campaigns outside Lycia. First and foremost, to pay, to pay for mercenaries, Lycian dynasts started to issue silver coins in their own name in the late 6th century BC. This rich and extremely varied coinage continued until the end of the dynastic system in the mid 4th century, when Lycia became part of the Hecatomnid satrapy of Caria. For this whole period, coins are the primary source for the political history and the topography of the region. They provide a unique, a unique opportunity to explore the internal political system and developments of a marginal region within the Persian Empire. Coin legends preserve the names of more than 50 dynasts and at least 15 different mints. Most of them have been localized and are shown in this map. The earliest Lycian coins are on a common weight standard of just over 9 gram, the so-called middle standard. By the mid-5th century, two different regional weight standards had evolved. In Western Lycia, the weights were lowered to the so-called light standard, which was modeled on the Attic standard. One light Lycian stater of 8.7 gram corresponded to two Athenian drachmae. On the other hand, in Eastern Lycia, the weights were raised to the so-called heavy standard of approximately 10 gram. We will have a closer look at these developments later on. In the map, the mints which used the light standard are marked with triangles and the ones which used the heavy standard with squares. The production and circulation areas overlapped in the central Lycian highlands. The classification of Lycian coinage is based on the works of George Francis Hill in the late 19th century and Otto Merkholm in the 60s and 17th of the last century. Five different classes can be distinguished, which followed each other chronologically with significant overlaps in time. The first class comprises the earliest Lycian coins with the forepart or a head of an animal on the obverse and the rough or patterned in Q's reverse. The example shown here has the most frequent obverse type, the forepart of a boar. Still today, wild boars figure prominently among the Lycian fauna. In the second class, the incuse reverses are changed for pictorial ones, usually animals or mythical creatures. The example on this slide comes from the Noe horde, which we will discuss in a moment. It has a winged horse galloping to the left on the obverse and a facing lion head on the reverse. After the Persian Wars, a dynast named Kuprili managed to establish a sort of hegemony over all of Lycia. He used various mints all over the region and introduced a new reverse type of a triskeles within a square or later within a circular in cues. This reverse type was adopted by most of his contemporaries and defines the third class of Lycian coins. This example was issued by a dynast named Tenegure around the mid of the 5th century. On the reverse, the dynast's name is written in Lycian script. In the left upper edge, you can see the personal symbol of his family. 
The obverse has a horned lion griffin to the left with the same symbol behind the wing. Around 430 BC, there were some major changes in Lycian coinage. It now becomes clear from hoard evidence that the eastern and central Lycian mints were shut down for about a generation. In contrast, western Lycian coinage experienced a boom. Responsible for this, this development was the dynast Kerei, who emerged victorious from the wars of succession after the death of Kuprili. While under the hegemony of Kuprili, many local dynasts continued to issue coins in their own name, Kerei now monopolized Lycian coinage. For his coins, he introduced the new obvious type of the head of Athena in an attic helmet. Apparently, this type was inspired by Athenian coins that dominated the international market in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean at that time. Kerry also introduced a new denomination system for the fractions that corresponded to the Attic one. This measure was interpreted as a political gesture since Lycia was part of the Delian League for a short period of time in the mid 5th century. However, the Lycians had left the League long before the reform, and Kerry's own coin portraits in Persian headgear leave no doubt about his loyalty to the Persian Empire. Probably, the reform was rather motivated by the fact that Kerry regularly employed Greek mercenaries, who expected to be paid one Attic drachma a day. The new obverse type and the Attic weight fractions will have encouraged the acceptance of his coins among non lycians At the turn of the century, the unstable political unity had broken up again, and the eastern mints resumed production on the heavy standard. The coins of this fifth and last class have the common obvious type of a lion's scalp and usually were struck on flat and white flans. The example shown here was issued by Mitra Pata and has a remarkable fine portrait of that dynast on the reverse. It comes from an early 4th century hoard that is part of the ANS collection. A precondition to make these coins speak as a historical source is a reliable chronology. Unfortunately, there is still much uncertainty about the chronology of dynastic Lycian coinage. Previous research has largely focused on a typological approach and was dominated by a radical skepticism towards hordes from the numismatic market. Until now, dye studies were performed only selectively on very few groups, and all of them are seriously outdated. This has led to grievous errors in the reconstruction of sequences, which, had, uh, which obstructed historical interpretation. It comes hardly as a surprise that historians have not shown much interest in the material so far. When I wrote my thesis on Achaemenid Anatolia, I started to realize the huge potential of Lycian coins for historical questions. Fortunately, I got to, uh, um, to know Jonathan Kagan, who encouraged me to pursue the topic further and led my first numismatic steps. My ongoing project on Lycian coinage has two phases. In the first phase, I have analyzed the relevant, uh, the re relevant uh, coin hoards to establish a reliable chronological framework. The chairman's fellowship enabled me to travel to New York and to study the Lycian colle uh, collection of the ANS, which is one of the largest worldwide and contains several important coin hoards. This autopsy proved extremely helpful and allowed me to better understand the rather complicated early phases of Lycian coinage. My hoard analysis is now completed and I have entered the second stage, in which I perform a full die study of Lycian dynastic coinage that will result in a corpus. Today, I will focus on the aspect of chronology and present some results of my work on the Lycian coins in the ANS collection. There are several kinds of information that can help with reconstructing a numismatic chronology. Sometimes there are literally text or inscription that state, for example, the reign of a certain ruler, which gives a time frame for his coins. 
Unfortunately, Lycian dynasts are rarely mentioned in literary sources, and most of their inscriptions cannot be dated exactly. More helpful are foreign coin types. Lycian coinage is extremely varied, and many types were adopted from various Greek mints. In some cases, the models can be dated precisely, which gives a terminus postquem for the Lycian copies. Not only types were imported to Lycia, but also the raw material. Lycia had no own silver resources, and consequently, the Lycians frequently overstruck foreign coins. The overstrikes were not always uh, executed with care, and sometimes the undertypes can still be um, distinguished. Again, they give a terminus in postquem for the Lycian overtype. But all of this concerns only relatively few coins. In order to reconstruct the chronology of the bulk of the material, one has to turn to the analysis of coin hoards and die sequences. Up to now, some 50 hoards with dynastic Lycian coins have been recorded. Almost all of them come from illicit excavations and had to be reconstructed from the numismatic market. The earliest hordes with Lycian coins are usually mixed hordes from the Eastern Mediterranean and from Egypt. The most important reference point, not only for early Lycian coins, but for um, archaic Greek coins in general, is the Asiut hoard. It was dated by Martin Chesser Price and Nancy Wagner to about 475 BC, a date that was subsequently questioned as too early. While some groups of the horde might be later by a decade or so, for the Lycian part of the, uh, the horde, the old date seems to be correct. After the mid 5th century, Lycian coins seems to have rarely traveled beyond the region's borders. The hordes of that period almost exclusively consisted of Lycian coins. An exception is the Elmele or Decadrachm horde, nicknamed after the rare Athenian Decadrachmus that were included. Of its almost 2,000 coins, roughly half is Lycian, the other half comes from various mints within the Delian League. The hoard is crucial for the chronology of many mints, and its full publication is long awaited. From the list on this slide, it becomes clear that we now have a dense sequence of hordes for the whole of the 5th and the early part of the 4th century, which at least one hoard every decade. The collection of the ENS includes four important Lycian hordes, marked in red. In what follows, I will discuss the first three of them and show how they contribute to our understanding of Lycian coinage. I start <clears throat> with the oldest one, a hoard of uh, 63 Lycian coins published by Sidney Noé in the centennial volum uh, volume of the ANS. They are all statairs on the early middle standard and, show, uh, and share the same obvious type of a winged horse to the left. Consistent obvious types and styles suggest that the whole series was produced at the same mint. Based on the reverse type, Nui distinguished five different groups. Group A with a patent in cues, group P with the forepart of a bull to the left, group C with a facing lion head, group D with the forepart of a lion attacking a bull, and group E with a square in cues with dotted border but without pictorial motive. I would like to show two, uh, two things. One, that based on new material, Noe's sequence can be corrected. And two, that the series continues far beyond the closing of the horde. Group A with the patent in Q's reverse still belongs to the earliest class of Lycian coinage and, that, uh, and thus must be the oldest group. The hoard included eight, uh, 18 coins of group E, most of them from the same pair of dice. This strongly suggests that group E is the youngest group, which is also supported by a die link with group D indicated by a red line. The shared obvious die was already worn when it was used for coins of group D and is hardly recognizable anymore on the coins of group E. This leaves the gap between group A and D for the groups C and uh, B. A newly discovered die link shows 
that the Nui sequence of these two groups needs to be revised. Group B shares an obvious die with group D, as two coins in the former collection Winzemann Falgera prove. The new sequence is supported by another die link between group B and group C. The obvious die of some group C coins in the Nui hoard is attested also for coins of group B in the Elmerley hoard. On the coins of group C, it looks fresher as on the ones of group B, which shows the priority of group C. As a first result, the sequence CBDE is secured by dial links. This confirms the impression already formulated by Nui that the whole series was issued at the same mint. I have not mentioned yet that on coins of group B, D and E, the, Lys the Lysian letter T appears either on the hind leg of the winged horse, on the obvious die, or in the lower field of the reverse. We will come to the possible meaning of this letter later. What is important now is that this letter provides a link to the continuation of the series, which was absent in the Noe hoard, but features prominently in the Elmerly hoard. The Elmerly hoard is about half a generation later than the Noe hoard and included only few coins of Noe's groups C, B, D and E. However, more numerous were coins with the familiar obvious type of a winged horse with the letter T and the hind leg, combined with a new reverse uh, type of um, a lion head to the left with the letter T on its cheek. I have not yet found an actual die link to the Nui group E, but there can be little doubt that this group continues the sequence, and I have named it group F. The Elmerly Hort provides an important die link to the next group, which with its square in Q's Triskillis reverse already belongs to the third class of Lycian coins. With about 450 coins in the Elmerly Hort, that group G made up for almost half of the Lycian coins in that hoard. The, the Triskillis reverses are inscribed with various dynast names in Lycian script. The earliest one is Espehi, the latest one included in the Elmerle hoard can be read either as Jan or as Nai, which may be an abbreviation. While the earlier coins were all on the middle standard, under Jan, the weights were raised to the heavy standard of about 10 gram. In that standard, the series continues beyond the time frame of the Elmerle hoard. The Lycian hoard found near the central Lycian town of Kash can be dated to the 440s by its Lycian and Athenian content. It was studied by Otto Merkel, who so only recorded a small part, which ended in the von Aulok collection. Among the oldest coins in that hoard are some winged horse Triskelis Stateas of Jan, struck from dyes absent from Elmerly, and thus probably a few years younger. The series continues with coins of the same type in the name of the dynasts Kuprili and Chinacher, who share a common obvious style. These two dynasts apparently used the mint jointly for some time, since they both issued also coins of the final group, which I have named H. For this group, the reverse's design was changed from square to circular in cues, a change that according to the cash word, must have happened around 450. The following table summarizes which coins of the series were included in the three hordes, Noe, Elmerle and Kash. In addition, also the Asyut hoard is listed since it gives a reliable terminus antiquem for the early groups. As, as we have seen, the Noe hoard closes with group E, and the same is true for Asyut. The group E coins seem to be among the latest ones in the Lycian part of the Asyut hoard, which implies this, uh, that Asyut and Noe were closely, uh, closed approximately at the same time. Elmerle contained no coin of the earliest group A, and only a few of the subsequent ones until E. Group F, with the lion head reverses, was already more numerous and group, A, uh, and group uh, G with the square in Q's Triskelis reverses accounted for almost half of the Lycian coins in the hoard. 
the number of different dyes in groups F and G, as well as the last five different dynast names involved, suggests that these groups span over a considerable period of time. Between the closure of the Noe and the Asyut horde on the one hand, and the one of the Elmerli horde on the other hand, must lie more than a decade, which confirms an, er an early date for the Lycian part of the Asyut horde of about 475. How long before that date the series started is hard to tell, but the five different reverse types and numerous die combinations of that early phase make a start after 490 BC unlikely. The Kash horde included only coins of group F, um, uh, G and H, uh, allegedly more than 25. The latest ones apparently belonged to the time of the Horde's closure in the 440s. The series thus spans over approximately half a century, from the 490s to the 440s. Finally, we come to the question of where the mint of the series can be localized. The heavy standard of the later groups points toward a, towards a place in central or eastern Lycia. The considerable volume of the series, as well as its long duration, speak for a major settlement. Within the sequence of the mints of Zagaba and Apollonia in central Lycia, there is no space to fit in such a large series. The most likely candidate is Limura, the major settlement of eastern Lycia, of which no coins before um, the 460s have been plausibly identified so far. This hypothesis is supported by the fact that the Elmerle Horde contained six coins that were struck by an obvious die of group H, but have different reverse uh, different reverse type with a square in uh, inscribed Rodion in Greek letters. These coins were apparently produced for Greeks from Rhodes, which which, which would perfectly fit Limera, that was surrounded by Greek uh, Rodian colonies. But what does the letter T stand for that, that, that appears on so many dice? A possible explanation is that it stands for Trimli, the name which with the Elysians called themselves in their own language, rendered as Termili by the Greek authors. <clears throat> I now come to a new and unpublished word. Mm, the major part of which mm, entered the ANS collection in 2002 and 2003. It consists of at least 350 Lyceum coins and has much overlap with the Elmerle hoard. The oldest coins of the new hoard still belong to the first class and have a four part of a bore on the obverse and the patent in Q's reverse. The continuation of that series into the classes 2 with pictorial reverses and 3 with triskeles reverses accounts for the largest part of the hoard. The development is comparable with the one we have just observed for the Nui hoard and need not re be repeated. All of these coins were struck according to the early middle standard, which was gradually reduced. Only with some of the latest coins in the hoard the light or attic standard of about 8.7 gram was reached. These coins are inscribed with the dynast names of Kukuli and some of his contemporaries. The new hoard thus is a few years younger than the Elmerle hoard, from which, um, um, which didn't in include any coin in the light standard. The new hoard is crucial for our understanding of the process by which the light standard was introduced in Western Lycia. I will demonstrate this with the example of one series. It starts with the coins of the second class, which have the forepart of boar to the left on the obverse and the forepart of a bull to the left and with, within a square in cues on the reverse. The new hoard includes four coins of that type, all struck from the same obverse die but from two different reverse dies. The second reverse die was later combined with a new obverse die showing a lion advancing left, devouring the leg of a bull. While this die combination is missing in the new hoard, the next one is included with nine coins. The same lion obverse die was combined with a new triskelis reverse. At some point, 
when the obvious die was already quite worn, the lesion letter K was added to the reverse die, probably standing for the dynast Kuprili. All coins of this first group belong to the middle standard with weights between 9 and 9.4 gram. Although die links are lost at that point, the continuation of the series can easily be identified on a typological basis. For the second group, the motives bull killing lion, bull and tree skillers were all retained. On the obverse, the lion now jumps onto the back of its prey. On the reverse, bull and tree skillers were combined into one image which shows a standing bull within a square in queues and a tiny triskelis in the field above. The new hoard included 19 coins of that type, all struck from the same obvious die, but from two different reverse dies. While on the first one the bull is standing to the left, on the second one its direction was changed to the right. The coins of this second group were struck on a slightly reduced middle standard just below 9 grams. The opus type was inspired from coins of the northern Greek polis Akantos. The nearest parallels are found in the very last phase of the period 1, according to the die study of Desneux. The Elmerle hoard included both Akantian coins of that phase and the Lycian copies. Since both were among the latest coins in that hoard, the Lycian engravers seem to have copied the recent coins according to the latest fashion. Both absent from Elmerle and from the new hoard are coins of a third group that apparently followed the second one. The obverse is dependent on slightly younger Arcantian models from the early phase of this nurse period too, post-dating the closure of the Elmerle hoard. The Triskeles reverse is inscribed with the name of Kukrili. The weights of these coins conform to the light standard of 8.7 gram. This table summarizes the hoard evidence for the series. Both the Elmerle and the new hoard included several coins of groups 1 and 2, but none of group 3. Since the new hoard included some other groups in the light standard that are still absent in Elmerle, it was probably closed a few years later, in the early 450s. While at this point some Western Lycian mints had already reached the light standard, the mints of the Bull Killing Lion series apparently hadn't done so. Apparently, the various Western Lycian mints reduced the coin weights at a different speed, some of them arriving at the light standard already around 460 BC, shortly after the closure of the Elmerle hoard, others only about a decade later. The historical background is Lycia's membership in the Delian League at that time. However, the gradual process of weight reduction speaks against a, a measure dictated by Athens. Rather, the dominance of Athenian money in the eastern Mediterranean motivated the Lycians to adapt to the Attic standard. Possibly, the older statairs in the middle standard were accepted by Greeks only as two Attic drachmae, which for the Lycians meant a loss of about 5%. Lowering the weight standard of their own coins would have been a good strategy to offset this disadvantage. As my last example, I would like to briefly discuss the Lycia 1987 hoard, a catalogue of which had, has recently been published by Jonathan Kagan. It includes at least 29 Western Lycian coins of the dynasts Vexere and Kerei in the light standard. While earlier coins of Vexere still belonged to the third class with the Triskelis reverse, his latest issue from Xanthos is the first one with the Athenia obverse, um, typical of class 4. As I have mentioned earlier, the, Athe uh, the Athena head was subsequently adopted by Kerei and became the universal obverse type in the latest phase of Western Lycian coinage. Based on this hoard and the second one of slightly later date, Jonathan Kagan has proposed a significant revision of the chronological sequence of rulers in the uh, Xanthus Valley. The two hordes clearly show that at the mint of Xanthus there was an uninterrupted sequence from Vexere over Herei 
to Denevelle. Wexere first introduced the Athena obverses, which were adopted by Carey and combined with his own portrait in Persian headgear. Carey issued this new type over a considerable period of time, as can be seen from the number of dyes and their progressive, progressive stylistic development. Denevelle first continued the Athena Persian head type and later switched the sides. The important point is that this dance sequence leaves no space for an issue of Kerry's brother Keriga, which was believed to predate Kerry's Xantian issues. Instead, Keriga's issue, which is of a very different type and fabric with flat and white flan, must have come after Denevele. This corrected sequence can now be confirmed by a com um, combined analysis of the epigraphic and num numismatic evidence. Two statue bases that were found in the Litoon of Xanthos preserve the votive inscription of Keriga's son Erbina. The Lucian inscription on the first base mentions the dedicant and his parents. It reads, Erbina offered this as a gift to Artemis, the son of Keriga and Upeni. In the Greek epigram on the second base we read, Having killed many men and having brought glory to his father, Arbinas, that is the Greek rendering of Erbina, conquered many cities and made a name for himself and for his ancestors in the whole of Asia. We thus learn that Erbina made military conquests on behalf of his father Keriga. In another epigram, on the same base, Erbina's deeds are reported more in detail. In his youth, he conquered three cities within one month, Xanthos, Pinara, and Telmessos with a good harbor, and he ruled over many Lycians, keeping them in fear. A similar content can also be restored in a mutilated passage of the former, pass uh, former epigram. When he was just 20 years old, he conquered three cities in one month. Xanthos and Telmessos and Pinara. Fortunately, the famous Tissaphernes hoard published by Silvia Hurta includes a full sequence of the mint of Telmessos, one of the three cities conquered by Erbina according to the inscriptions. A crucial dye link marked with a red line proves that Erbina conquered the place from Denevele. It was generally believed that after his conquests, Erbina ruled over the whole Xanthos Valley. The inscriptions, however, seem to allude to the fact that Abina carried out his conquest on behalf of his father Kieriga. The final proof that Kieriga was still alive when his son invaded the Xanthus Valley is provided by a unique statue that was offered for auction uh, recently. It shares the characteristic type of Abina's final issue at Telmessos, with the head of Athena on the obverse and with Heracles advancing to the left within a circular reverse. The combined numismatic and epigraphic evidence leaves little doubt about what has happened. About 410 BC, Kerry was succeeded by Denevele, probably his own son, after a reign of two decades. Kerry's younger brother Kieriga, who was based in central Lycia and himself was already of advanced age, didn't recognize his nephew's priority. Therefore, Kieriga ordered a military campaign to overthrow Denevele's rule, which was successfully carried out by his son Erbina. Erbina's victory prize was the harbor of um, Telmessos, at the western fringes of Lycia, and thus suitable as an appanage for a presumptive heir to the throne. Kieriga himself took residence at the old capital of Xanthos, where he issued the coin that we have already seen before. Now, we can also understand the peculiar obvious design. The laurel wreath that surrounds the head of Athena alludes to Kieriga's victory over Denevele and his son's conquest of West Western Lycia. We may even go a step further and explore the historical background of these events. Both epigraphic and numismatic evidence suggests that Kerei and his successor Denevele closely cooperated with Tissaphernes, the Persian satrap of Sparta. 
A mutilated passage on the famous inscribed pillar of Xanthus possibly reports an intervention of Tissaphernes on behalf of Denevelis' smooth accession. As long as Tissaphernes ruled in western Anatolia, Kieriger had little chance to overthrow his nephew. This situation changed when the younger Cyrus arrived at Sardis to take over command in the west. Soon, a bitter rivalry emerged between the experienced former satrap Tissaphernes and his teenage successor of royal blood. Literary sources report that Cyrus took every chance to replace his adversary's followers with, it, with, with its own ones. It's quite conceivable that in this situation, Kierga joined the camp of Cyrus in search of support for his claims to power. Cyrus was probably happy to get rid of Denevelli, who had been in the camp of Tissaphernes for some time. Although this scenario is hypothetical, it would also explain why, why Kerika drops out from the numismatic record soon after Cyrus' tragic, tra tragic end at Kunaxa. Finally, our reconstruction sheds a new light on an old problem, the question for whom the famous Nerid monument of Xanthus was erected. It's generally attributed to Abina, which is unlikely given the fact that he never ruled at Xanthus and probably died before his father. Denevele, who was recently proposed as an alternative, can be excluded on chronological reasons. The most likely candidate, in my opinion, is Kieriga. The upper sockle frieze consists of a series of town sieges. The architecture uh, is, clear, is clearly defined as Lycian, and the detailed narrative has the character of a historical relief. Therefore, it's quite possible that the frieze depicts Urbina's campaign against Denevele and his con conquest of Xanthus, Pinara and Tamesos. On the central block of the West Frieze, a man in Persian dress seated on a throne is being approached by a group of bearded men. The scene is the ruler receiving the delegation of a conquered town. If this is right, the seated man could be Kieriga, who accepts the capitulation of Xanthos after his uh, son's successful siege. There has been much debate about the identification of the female figures that were placed between the columns of the tomb. Since they all stand on aquatic creatures like fish, shells, and water birds, they were interpreted as Nereids, the daughters of Poseidon, which gave the monument its modern nickname. Thurston Robinson has proposed a different identification as water nymphs, who were venerated at Exantian Leton. This view is certainly correct, and it finds support in Apinus' epigrams from the sanctuary. The last lines of one epigram read as follows. May Leto and Apollo give you, Arbinus, wrath of victory and of happiness. Then Artemis and the nymphs will give glory to Gergis, that is Kieriga, no less than to their ancestors. If the monument was indeed intended for Kieriga, the female sculptures would be a perfect illustration of this sort. With this admittedly hypothetical connection of numismatic, epigraphic, and archaeological evidence, I conclude my presentation. I hope that I have been able to show you the extraordinary potential of dynastic Lycian coinage as a historical source and the need for a thorough numismatic study on this exciting material. Thank you. Thank you, Helmut. That was excellent. Uh, we have a, about uh, 15 plus minutes uh, for questions and answers. Um, I, if you would like me to read your question, please uh, put it into the chat. If you would like to say your own question out loud, I encourage you to unmute and, and ask it. Uh, we have a question in the chats. Uh, many Lycian flans are far from round further from round than most Greek coins, what was the difference in how the flans were made? Uh, 
Um, yeah. Uh, the, during the, the uh, almost uh, um, 150 years of production of, or more than 150 years of production of Lycian um, coins, the, there seems to have been a change in uh, in the appearance of of flans. One can note that the early flans of the of the late sixth and early fifth centuries uh, are, are quite uh, fat and uh, and uh, and um, mm, have minor dimensions, whereas the late flans. Uh, are wide and flat ones. This is a, a change that can also be observed in contemporary uh, um, uh, mints uh, of the eastern of the eastern uh, Mediterranean, for example, in, in, in Cilicia and Pamphylia. Mm. Many Lycian coins were overstruck on uh, on either older Lycian coins or uh, foreign coins. And that may account for uh, the peculiar uh, form of, uh, of some, uh, some flans that we, that, that we can observe. Thank you, Helmut. Uh, we, do we have any other questions? Uh, Jonathan, your name is brought up a few times. I don't know if you want to uh, chime in with anything. No, thank you, Helmut. Uh, uh, you summarized a lot of material very, very well, I think. Um, if uh, you might, if you can pull up again that uh, Kariga coin, um, is that one with, is that one of the ones with the dolphin on it? No. Uh... That is, uh, that is the one uh, on which Athena sits on a rock. Uh, the one with the dolphin is a success, uh, uh, successive is, 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 uh, is, view of, is, is uh, of uh, a man named Kerry, oh, that's uh, it's which, Kerry yeah. uh, which I think is Kerry's son named after his uncle, but uh, one can't be sure. But I, I think that but the dolphin on that coin... It was by, by a different man. Yes, but that, the dolphin and that coin, I do think, must somehow relate to the Nereid monument, and um, um, and that it would be perfect for his I, son to be uh, be putting it I, on his coin. So I, I, I agree with your agree reading with you. of it. So I, I, I originally I wanted to to also to to show this coin uh, because uh, this illusion uh, is 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 very clear, uh, but I I took it out of my presentation uh, due to the lack of time. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. We have another question. Can you say more about how you will approach the die study of 7,000 coins and how long do you think this will take? Yeah, uh, I have been working on this die study uh, quite some, some time, uh, always uh, beside other works. And uh, my collection at, uh, at, at, at the present point uh, contains about 3000 coins so uh, almost half of the of the material is uh, is done uh, my visit to new york uh, and uh, my study of the ans collection was a major step since uh, this involved uh, almost 1000 1000 uh, coins which i could take in, in autopsy and most of them uh, are unpublished ones um, the, the major Lycian co uh, collections, uh, public uh, collections, are the one of the ANS, the one of the British Museum, um, the one of, uh, of the, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, in Berlin, and in Paris. And uh, most of that material is, uh, is already published, but I want to, to, to take it in an autopsy as, uh, as well uh, during the next uh, months and, uh, and in the next years, probably. And then is uh, a big part of about 2,000 coins um, from auction catalogues. I have already gone through the auction catalogues of the last 25 years. Uh, which can 
quite easily accessed, uh, be accessed by uh, in uh, by the internet. Uh, and I have to start now with the with the earlier catalogs, with uh, which will be quite some 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 work. Mm, I'm now in a fortunate position that uh, I uh, I just got a new job this week as an um, assistant on the Numis, uh, Institute of Numismatics of the University of uh, Vienna with Bernhard Wojtek. And uh, in this new position, I can uh, I can pursue uh, my 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 Lycian, uh, studies uh, full time, and uh, I hope to 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 be able to produce this corpus within a reasonable period of time of, let's say, three years. Excellent! Congratulations on a new position. Well deserved. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for you about how far back in auction catalogs can you go with uh, with good enough images for for a die study like this? Depends it depends on the on the on the uh, on the auction catalogs. Uh, there are relatively few early auction catalogs with uh, with plates at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to go back further than 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 the the, the uh, last decades of the of the of the 19th or the the first ones of the of the 20th centuries it's it's, it's not very sensible um there are good some some good plates uh, in these early catalogs but most catalogs of the uh, of that time just don't have plates so uh, they are not usable for 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 a, a die study but um that is uh, a point that, that concerns the, um, the the research history of of, of Lycia. Uh, differently than 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 uh, with other regions of the Greek world, there is no collect collecting of Lycian coins before the mid of the nineteenth century. The first, as far as I can see, the first Lycian coins that. Uh, Arrived in Europe and were 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 were, were, were studied by um, numismatists uh, were the ones that were brought um, by Charles Fellows in the eighteen forties and uh, by his works the the, the the numismatic studies of Lycian coinage begins but there are relatively few coins in the in the in the nineteenth century as can also be seen for example. By the work of uh, Ernest Babylon, uh, who uh, whose um, treatise on on, Lycian, on the Lycian material, uh, which was published in 1910, is until today one of the best treatments of this material. But it involves just uh, just some 400 coins or so. So uh, you can see the material increased rapidly uh, in the 20th century and. It, Especially in the since the 1960s, 19, uh, 1970s. So, for example, to give a last example, um, uh, Otto Merkel, who did uh, really exceptional work on uh, on uh, on some series, uh, especially uh, of the Xantian dynasty of of Kuprili and uh, and Heri and Heriger. Uh, Performed the only die study so far uh, on this material, and his die study on Kuprili was based on I think 180 coins. Uh, now the material has almost uh, 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 I think uh, increased by four or five times. So uh, there are many many new dies, uh, new die combinations, and uh, and one sees. Far more connections and uh, and sequences than 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 Merkel could do at uh, at at this time. Hmm. That's intriguing. Uh, we have a line of praise for you in the chat. Thank you for an informative and well documented presentation, and congratulations on your new position. Of course. Uh, is there any other? Are there any other questions? We have a handful of minutes left. I encourage you to either post your question in the chat or unmute and uh, ask yourself. It's perfectly acceptable. Uh, if not, we might wrap it up here. Uh, Helmut, thank you so much for a great talk once again. Uh, congratulations once again. Uh, we hope to see you back in New York uh, in the near future. And uh, everyone, enjoy your Friday afternoon.